On Friday the 10th of November 2017, three people were admitted to hospital with serious food poisoning, incorrectly assumed to be botulism. Around 3.30 in the morning? 3.30 in the morning. Yes. Yes. Then uh, I hear the sound first Subi is omitting. Mm -hmm. Then I wake up, I got a little bit like a turning. Dizzy? Yeah. Yeah, feeling dizzy and the, it feels like uh, I the, got this, um, all the tremors and I can't control myself mm -hmm. that time. And I just uh, came in the bathroom, I just to hold her hand. She is like, yeah, I can, I can hold her. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, then I just take it to her to other bedroom. Then, uh, um, <coughs> then I, I was also vomiting. 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 Yes. Then I, I thought, oh, it's, it's coming to real bad. Yeah. Then I, I. Then he asked mom how how she is doing. Yeah. And then yeah, and then she started and she was panic and Then I talked to my mom. She so, you 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 be okay? Then she said, oh no, I'm just trying to. It's like a turning things. Mm. Then she started vomiting. Then uh, she fell down to the, the floor. And I see she's there. Then uh, my elder one is wake up. Yeah, then. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she, was, was, she, was, she, she was convulsing on the floor. She was convulsing. Yeah. Then I asked us to be oh, okay. We, we need to call ambulance. Then, we, then I ring from my phone. Triple one. Then. Uh, I just to give you the address and the details, everything. And then we have like a three page patient. Then I have to come quickly. Yeah. Then they came here. The three of gone. The following effects were endured by the three victims for a period of almost three weeks. All of the effects were recorded after the patients were administered botulism antitoxin. Three days after admission. Moving tongue out, 1.5 centimetres of mouth past jaw but cannot put tongue back in. Seven days after admission. Immediately concerned regarding safety to both staff and patient due to legs thrashing around as well as arms. Unable to predict movements and multiple near misses with staff being connected by limbs. Discussed with an on-call doctor regarding my concerns about overall safety for everyone and my wish to try to loosen leg restraints to limit patient's ability to raise legs higher than the bedsides. Eight days after admission, groaning, grunting, spontaneously or on pain stimuli, constant spontaneous limb movements, all limbs restrained to maintain patient safety, tongue protrusion at times. Nine days after admission, patient opening eyes, thrashing around and lifting himself off the bed, required four staff to hold him down, has had an episode of fever, severe confusion and agitation. Currently unable to examine due to increased levels of agitation, now biting, scratching. Patient moving limbs spontaneously, however, very frequently and forcefully sitting up and flopping back into bed. For two to two and a half hours, patient required six staff to hold him down for his own safety. At times, patient curls up into fetal position, trying to bang his head on the railing. Patient attempting to bite staff. Patient has abrasion on elbow from rubbing it on bed sheets. Four point restraint in situ. 10 days after admission. Moving all limbs, vocalizing. Nurse reports she was asking about her daughter-in-law. Some confused speech, thought man was God. Eye, mostly half open at times. Eye rolled upward frequently. Occasionally open spontaneously, moaning at times. Constantly moves all limbs and upper torso while awake. Four point restraints plus straps over his abdomen and upper thigh remained. 11 days after admission. Attempting to bite at times, all limbs and midriff restrained, restless all of the time, attempting to sit up, verbalizing spontaneously, spontaneously moving all arms and legs, reportedly making incomprehensible sounds, neurotoxicity with unknown agent, biting, scratching, hitting head against bed rails, nine staff presently in attendance tried to control situation. Two weeks after admission, doctors activated an adult deterioration detection system in response to Shibu's worsening condition. So what's the next thing you can remember from then? Uh, <laughs> 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 next thing you remember is, is 
waking up in the HDU. Yeah. yeah. That's when wow. they rang me and said, this guy's awake. <laughs> uh, and um, when was that? It was a full, um, I'm going to say roughly three weeks down the line. I was at work when, they, when the hospital rang to say uh, she was sitting up on his bed. Um, so I rushed over. I was there in about 30 minutes after that phone call. I expected this person who was straining against bed for so much to be uh, weak, to, um, to be slow. But what I, what I saw to, completely took me by surprise. Because he was wide awake. Um, he complained of no pains whatsoever. Yep, he was sitting up on his bed. And he was very clear and articulate about what he wanted. He was drinking gallons of water. <laughs> he was thirsty, yes. Um, and he recognized me. Interestingly, I think we spoke for, for an hour or two, and this was in the afternoon, and he fell asleep later on in the day. And he woke up the next day, he was in massive pain. It's like all that, uh, whatever was left out, you know, just that onset of pain and constant aches and memory lapse. It all started off, he went back to sleep, he woke up, and it was chaos. <laughs> Every inch of him making. And that's when I asked him a few questions as in, do you know what happened? Um, because there's just speculations as to what, what put you here. Can you, can you remember anything? And one of the very first things he said was, uh, I was given this meat by this, this hunter um, close to Tyrell. I knew right then I shouldn't have taken it. Um, and so I asked him, well, what, what, what is it? What actually, you know, what's, what's the doubt about? said the hunter had a dog and uh, on the day that he went to collect the pig uh, he didn't find the dog there so he asked uh, the hunter what happened to him and said the dog died while actually hunting the pig and he asked him for any possible causes and he said ah my the usual you know how things are here um, there's been a 1080s prey the most most likely he would have run around picked up a few pellets and stuff she will also notice that there were dog mark bites on the on the leg of the of, of the pig. While he did not put two and two together, I mean, there's, it's speculative as to whether the dog bit to, bit the pig and died as a result. We do not know. Uh, he didn't know as well, but he was concerned though, you know, with the uh, with the, the the sequence that just did not fit. So he asked the hunter over and over again, "Is it fine? Um, this is what I'll be giving my family." Uh, so is it fine? Is it absolutely fine? Right? This, this happens all the time, so nothing to worry about. And that's how he took the pig home. And so he was pretty upset when he woke up. You know, that was one of the first things that he remembered, and he was pretty upset with this chap when he woke up. When I was away from the pork, from him, he told me his dog was died for something. He bite the pork or I don't know how he get the pork from, and uh, yeah. So his dog died from that same pork? Yes. Then he also very upset. Then the dog was dying. Mm. Then, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, he, but he say, when he get, got the pork, that's, a, that's the same day he, the dog died. So the dog died the same day Same the day, pork. When, and the when he got the pork. And the pork had some marks yes, from the dog yes. biting. Yeah. yeah. But then, I, then I asked them if you have any problem with the when I was eating. Then I he said, "Oh no, it's no problem. We can still, yeah, have it." Yeah, he said about the 1080. That's of course the should be the dog died. You didn't. You didn't know no. poison no. that you could die if you ate no. it. No, I didn't know that. That pork. Could yeah, no way I know that. You know, no, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. I think a lot of New Zealanders are going to learn this for the first yes. time. Actually, yes, yes. <laughs> it is common for people's dogs to be poisoned in New Zealand. In this research paper by Charles Eason et al., it is noted that between 1960 and 1976, 254 dogs were reported killed by 1080. In 2011, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment released a report on 1080 and stated that just eight dogs had been reported to have died from 1080 in the previous four years. 
However, questioning the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment's accuracy, Dr Joe Pollard identified research undertaken in 2008 by Otago University's pharmacy school. The researchers randomly contacted 125 vets and of the 52 respondents, 65 dogs had been treated for 1080 poisoning in a single year, representing just a fraction of the actual cases. Dr Pollard states in her report that this makes a nonsense of the claim made this June by our PCE. The eight dogs figure is clearly a gross misrepresentation of the actual number of dogs killed. Dr Pollard states in her report that this is just one of a large number of misleading statements in her report on 1080, which is heavily biased towards its use, as was the IRMA 2007 reassessment. And so now, now that you're home and it's now, what, nearly six, eight weeks after the event, what symptoms are you now having? You said before you've very sore legs still? Yeah, I just have it. I can run, run, run it with it like a normal people. I can, I can feel it's very hard to walk. Right. Then uh, it's like more muscle pains. Yeah. Yeah. I, I cannot run. You can't run? No, it's not. Because your like, legs... Be, like this, it's not as straight. The balance. The balance is not right. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I try to run, but uh, <laughs> no, very hard to run. No, I feel like um, it's not strong like before. And I feel like a bit... Uh, tremors, like a bit shaking. Still shaking? I, yeah, sometimes. And... Very tired and muscle pain. Yes, both the hands same hands. sore leg as yeah. well. We have both hands. Oh. And uh, my mother, she had a problem with the left, I think left, 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 left hand. The no. 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 oh, Then she can feel anything. She the can't whole. feel. No. The initial working diagnosis made on the day of admission was consumption of meat containing poison used for possum rodent killing, neurotoxin, 1080, strychnine poisoning. Saying this, the differential remains wide, although we do not think this is infection. I cannot come up with an alternative pathology for raised lactate. The document also suggests may need to see if police can test the meat for neurotoxins. The Health Board sent some tests away to Queensland for testing for botulism. It's a difficult test, they don't do it in New Zealand. We kept being told the tests were pending, the results were imminent. In fact, they had the results back on the 8th of December, but they didn't disclose the results to the public until the 22nd of December. I don't understand why there was that delay. I know the ambulance came to here. Then after that I can remember anything. They take it to Tokoro or, or any, anywhere. <laughs> well, on, in the media, they were telling the public that you were responding well to the botulism antitoxin. They reported on that quite early. I can't tell you the exact day. Mm. But mm. it sounds like, yeah, you probably don't know for yourselves, but it sounds like it wasn't that well. well uh, yeah. Politics before patients' health. It's really concerning and it looks like well, that's what's happening here. Why would you continue to diagnose something that's almost unheard of in New Zealand, the symptoms are wrong, the test results are wrong, the timing is wrong, the experts are saying it is not botulism. Why not be honest and look at all of the evidence, all of the likely causes, and actually give the patients the best possible treatment? One thing's very certain, the doctors started off diagnosing this as 1080 and further down the line for some unknown reason um, that diagnosis changed to botulism and they have admitted at the end that it wasn't. But all of the botulism testing was negative so on top of 
all of the other tests that they did of the patients, blood samples and the like that were negative for botulism, the nerve function tests that were negative for botulism, the serum tests that were negative for botulism, we now also have that the food had no Clostridium perfringens, which is the bacteria that causes botulism, and it had no botulism toxin in it. My question is, how many negative tests do you need before you acknowledge that the facts speak for themselves and perhaps it's not botulism, it's some other cause? I know that's came from, it's not a botulism. Mm -hmm. If it came from 1090, I need the result from the 1090. Then, oh, okay, I have a result. Then he sent it to my email. So he drove yeah. back to Hamilton yes. and then, then he, he emailed he it back emailed, to you. Yeah. Then uh, Richard came to here. Then I asked him, is it botulism or any other thing? Yeah. And he says, it's not a botulism or. 1090. Then I ask more questions about yeah, the 1090. Yeah, yeah. And I want to know about the thing. And he said, oh yeah, I tested. Yeah. Landcare Research, the Crown Research Institute that undertook the 1080 poison testing, states in its 1080 testing protocol that urine samples should be transported, chilled or frozen to the testing laboratory within two days of taking the samples, if urgent, analysed immediately. However, the samples from the family members were not received by Landcare Research until 18 days after the patients were admitted to hospital. Oddly, the urine sample for Shibu has the exact same sample number as a blood sample sent to Australia for botulism testing, taken at the same time and on the same day, but acknowledged by different doctors. So you emailed to ask to him that? Yes, them yep. for that, but he didn't reply. Yeah. But in, he's in he holiday. Is in response to the, uh, the, the report that yes. he sent through, yeah. um, as a reply to that yeah. report, uh, he said, no, I can't accept this particular urine sample test. Yeah. Uh, you've taken meat from my home. Yeah. Um, where where are that? the results that's from the meat? And there's no reply. Yeah. We still are stuck in the situation that's quite similar to something out of the X-Files. There is something out there. We still don't know what that something is. Now, the DHP, the MPI, and all the other agencies involved they could have easily avoided this issue, the issue of 1080. Considering that 1080 is such a controversial issue in this country, we could have easily avoided that, eliminated that once and for all, had they just t tested for the blood, the urine, or the vomit, or what, any other material in a timely manner. Um, but y you've seen it. The only thing that they have released to, to the media, or they have come up with, is a urine sample that's 18 days late. Um, I wonder if they'll come, come out and say that that was good enough. On the 9th of January 2018, the Interim Chief Executive of the Waikato District Health Board responded to questions presented by lawyer Sue Gray. Mr Wright stated, As you know, the signs of 1080 poisoning are evident within 30 minutes to 3 hours after ingestion. The family did not become unwell until 6 hours after eating the meal. So although 1080 was listed as a differential diagnosis, one of nine possible diagnoses. The clinical signs and the timeline would not support this as a possible cause. The subsequent negative urine sample also confirms this was not 1080 poisoning. In this Australian Department of Health Guideline for Acute Exposures to Chemical Agents, it states, clinical effects usually develop within 30 minutes to 2.5 hours, but may be delayed for as long as 20 hours. Samples for analysis should include suspected baits, vomitus, stomach contents, liver and kidney. It goes on to mention symptoms which match those that the poison family experienced. Look, there's a lot of information. I have sympathy for the DHB assembling the information. But once I got involved, I have to give them credit for urgently providing at least the medical files. And we've had people looking through those files and unravelling what happened there. But there are some files that we haven't still been given, and I've requested many times. I don't understand why they don't disclose all of the family's personal information. The particular files that we're really interested in are the ones by the Medical Officer of Health and his team, who are the public health officials supposedly protecting the public from these rare and unusual outbreaks of disease. Now, I would have thought that it's extremely important that the family understand why decisions were made by the Medical Officer of Health and his team, and the wider public get access to that information. Should be I eat more. <laughs> <laughs> I eat like a, like a, this. 
like a small flight, like a, then uh, my mom is like maybe two pieces or something. Right. Yeah, and she will eat maybe four or five pieces. It's like <laughs> small pieces. <laughs> mm. So yeah, when you say small, like yeah. one centimeter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. One of the things that's come out of this is that we actually don't know how toxic 1080 is and we don't know how toxic the metabolites of 1080 are, particularly for humans, because of course you can't test 1080 on humans. And the data that the government have been relying on is very old. It's based on assumptions made back in the 1940s. What's now apparent is that it may well be far more toxic than had been assumed. Okay. When, when I was decided to came to here, the meat is on the fridge. Other, other, all the food is like a bone, all the bacteria and everything. But this meat should be safe. Okay. When I was cooking, yeah. Okay. I think it's also not. Very, very, very. How long do you push or cook? It should be um, 40 minutes or, yeah. It takes uh, nearly 30 minutes. Hot? Yes, yes. It's very hot. Very, very hot. There's no such thing as, uh, um, I mean, the only meat consumed in India is well done. Because mm. the quality of the meat is not great. Everything is well done. There's yeah. no such thing as being rare. Yeah. <laughs> right, like Just nail it with the Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yes. Yes. So the latest update is we now have the Medical Officer of Health report and the results from the food testing or the limited food testing that the health people did. The report basically shows that they tested the food only for botulism and for shellfish toxins. They did not do any testing of the food for 1080, which is absolutely inexplicable when that was the first working diagnosis of the most likely cause. On Tuesday the 16th of January 2018, an ACC claims manager sent an email to the Waikato DHB Medical Officer of Health requesting missing reports and confirmation on test samples. In his reply, the Medical Officer of Health stated, 1080 testing was not undertaken as not suspected on any food stuff. It is now being tested for on the pork curry which was consumed. It has not been tested for on the raw meat as that came from several pigs apparently. Results are expected next week. It seems that politics are involved in the way the Waikato DHB handled this case. It's very difficult to form any other conclusion from the evidence that they've given to us so far. The first working diagnosis was 1080 or some other pest control poison. That kept disappearing off the list of possibilities, but individual doctors kept putting it back on the list. So some of the individual doctors were obviously very unhappy with the suggestion it was botulism. I don't understand why a cause that's been identified can disappear from the possible diagnosis of a patient, especially when they don't know what's causing it for sure, without some really, really clear evidence to, to remove it. They tested for a whole range of unusual possible causes, arsenic poisoning, lead poisoning, all sorts of things that seem highly unusual yet they didn't test for the most obvious cause. And when they did test, they didn't, they didn't do it promptly, they didn't do the best tests. It almost looks like they were determined to cling to botulism, whatever the test results, and they avoided doing tests for 1080, and it's not clear why apart from politics. On Friday the 10th of November 2017, the three family members were admitted to hospital with serious food poisoning, incorrectly assumed to be botulism. On Monday the 20th of November, TV Wild submitted an Official Information Act request to the Waikato District Health Board asking for the results of all toxin testing undertaken on the food samples and the patients, including for Brodificum, 1080 and their metabolites. It was not until one week after the TV Wild OIA was submitted that urine samples were sent to Landcare Research for 1080 poison analysis. In this protocol by Landcare Research, it states that 1080 poison is a very water-soluble compound that rapidly passes through the body. It's at its highest concentration in blood and stomach contents soon after poisoning. Sublethal doses of 1080 poison are quickly converted into metabolites that require special, unique testing that would not be detected in urine or by 1080 poison tests. A Landcare Research scientist describes 1080 metabolite testing 
The presence of fluorocitrate could also indicate sublethal exposure, which I think is why it is not tested for. It requires a separate analysis to the 1080 test. We don't have a validated test method for fluorocitrate in tissue. I suspect the same for Massey. The blood tests that they did, they did the most of the routine tests and they were all consistent with what you'd expect from 1080 poisoning. So the, the glucose levels are all over the place, the calcium levels were, were very odd. Unfortunately, they didn't do a reasonably common test, the citric acid test, which would have given us a really clear indication of whether there was 1080 poisoning or not because that test looks at changes to the, uh, changes to the Krebs cycle. So... Um, as far as you can ascertain from the blood tests that were done, 1080 is a live possibility. So again, when you were talking to Richard, you said, I think it's, I think it's a 1080. Yes. But you didn't tell him about the dog. No, I didn't tell any other stories. Yeah. And uh, he didn't ask me anything. And then he just said, no, it's he not the 1080 because we had it tested. Yeah. Mm. And he, he told me, you don't, you don't believe me? No. I said, no. <laughs> I need a black and white things. Mm. So you had a bit of discussion yeah, about just the dis mm. Then he asked me about the more question about the b other foods. Mm. How how long? Two days before, what do you eat? Mm -hmm. You eat from outside or some other things. Then he did, I, he just asked me. He just asked me how, where you got the pork. Then I say, yeah, I got one of my friend. His mm. name is. Mm. Then. Uh, that's it. He didn't ask me any other questions. Okay. Then yeah. Then he asked me, he's a Kiwi or Maori. Mm. Then I say, he's a Kiwi. Oh, okay. That's it. He didn't ask me any other questions. Ever. I've spoken to the hunter who caught the pig. He's very vague. Obviously, he's very nervous. But within the tear out area where the family live and where the hunter lives, there are numerous areas where there's 1080 poisoning done. So the hunter was very, he, he said he couldn't remember, which I understand is pretty unlikely for a pig hunter. There's also a suggestion that his dog died after catching that pig and being in that area. So there's some serious doubts about the safety in that area. Pig hunting is a sport enjoyed by many all across New Zealand. Every year, thousands of hunters roam the pine and native forests in search of their next meal of wild pork. In this Australian Operating Procedure document, it is stated that it is important to remember that some pigs can take 48 hours to die and may travel up to 8 kilometres from the baiting site. And in this study it is stated, some pigs survived high levels of 1080. Five pigs ingested more than 4 milligrams per kilo of body weight, but only two died. These results show there is large variability in the sensitivity of feral pigs to 1080. Charles Eason et al. stated in their research that a risk of 1080 poison carcasses to scavenging pigs may also exist, as well as a risk to humans from consuming animals that have received sublethal doses of 1080. However, no published data addressing these risks exists for pigs or humans. Further, we would recommend that any carcasses, possums or other animals, found in easily accessible areas are removed and disposed of in an appropriate manner. We acknowledge that this is impractical and inaccessible terrain. Because the thing is, in the medical notes, it actually says that you were going to be put into motel accommodation while they decontaminated the house. While the house was decontaminated. While the house was decontaminated. Was it, say it says that in the medical notes. It does. And so that's what I don't yeah. understand. Mm. Why would someone come in and take all of the meat from the freezer right. and then actually move the meat that was most likely to be contaminated from the stovetop to the fridge. I just think it's kind of interesting that it was in the media that there was this leftover food mm. that was in the fridge and nobody has come, come to pick it up. It. I think it's absolutely bizarre. It's, it's, and I'm just wondering if there's any point getting it tested now. Interestingly, the notes do say that they have just sent the food away for 1080 testing now, this so over two months after the event. Um, I'm not sure what they're hoping to find when it's this late, but anyway, at least they're ticking off a box. We still um, believe it's God's miracle. We are back to our life and thank to God because we didn't give to the kids. I, I usually uh, force my elder one to eat something because she's a bit skinny. So that's, that day she went to bed early and she didn't eat anything. I was uh, breastfeeding that time to baby and I was worried about all the things and 
is something go through the breast milk and I was worried about that things and that's really thankful I, to God and we didn't give to the kids. That's the only thing we still pray for God. And there were nine possibilities uh, for what put the three people in the hospital in the first place. Eight have been eliminated. Unfortunately, the one left in the room is an elephant. So, um, is, is anyone going to come out, wake up and see the elephant in the room? It's got all the hallmarks of a cover-up. Information's been withheld, odd diagnoses have been made, the family have not been told the truth, the media have not been told the truth. We're getting more information, and as we get that, it's raising more questions than it's answering. It's a really unusual and concerning situation. What's going on behind the scenes is this has turned into an amazing crowdsourcing of expertise. People have come forward with a whole range of different skills, veterinary skills, research skills, biochemistry skills, medical skills to help this family. The public are pulling together to do everything they can do to solve the case, help the family get ACC and help get some accountability of what on earth has gone on. If DHBs are encouraged to determine alternative diagnosis when people present with symptoms consistent with pest control poisoning, then there may be many incorrectly assessed cases in New Zealand. If you or someone you know believe you have been incorrectly diagnosed for poisoning, please contact the Minister of Health and to be added to the National Register, tbwild at extra.co.nz. Around 2 million kilograms of 1080 poison bait is spread by helicopters across New Zealand's forests and waterways every year. Enough poison to kill over 60 million people every year. The factory that imports 1080 poison and manufactures the baits is a state-owned enterprise. The two acting shareholders are the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Primary Industries. Its warning label states that a lethal dose of bait for an adult human could be as little as 30 grams. That's equivalent to just 2.5 of these 12 gram baits. Animals like deer and pigs can consume many more baits than is required to kill them, making their dead bodies massive toxic baits for any bird, animal or person that eats them. The latency period, which is how long it takes the victim to feel the effects of the poison, can be as long as 29 hours, meaning a live animal could be harvested for food while containing a fatal dose of poison. 1080 poison bait is eerily spread across large areas of New Zealand's forests and waterways to kill possums and rats. However, the toxic baits also kill thousands of pigs and deer annually, and poisoned animals can suffer for many hours before they die. Many species of native birds, bats and insects also consume the poisonous food. The poisoned insects and animals can then become toxic meals for unsuspecting native wildlife. And official information shows that kiwi and kia are dying in high numbers in poisoned forests. 1080 poison baits are dropped directly into all waterways at the same rate as the land areas around them in most aerial operations. Aquatic life, such as freshwater crayfish, quickly consume the bait and pass the deadly toxin onto other unsuspecting birds, animals and fish that eat them. The manufacturer's warning label states, take measures to minimise the chance of baits accidentally entering any body of water and harmful to aquatic organisms. However, no attempt is made to avoid waterways. The official toxin distribution charts show that almost all of the forest streams are poisoned at the same rate as the land areas around them. Water samples are often not tested using best practice protocols, meaning results are often unreliable. Ten eighty poison baits are spread across most of New Zealand's state forest parks. Apart from the targeted animals, the poison also kills thousands of wild pigs. The pigs are either killed by eating the baits directly or by scavenging the poisoned animals that litter the forest floors. Poisoned animal carcasses are left to decompose where they fall, be that on land or in water, despite the manufacturer's warning label stating that they are ecotoxic and that the exposed bodies of all poisoned animals should be collected and buried at a landfill approved for hazardous wastes. This scavenging poses a secondary poisoning risk to native wildlife or to hunters that may catch a pig that's travelled outside of a poisoned area weeks after an aerial operation.
Extensive independent information about 1080 poison use in New Zealand can be found on the 1080science.co.nz website and an extensive presentation of film footage of aerial poison operations and documentation can be found on tv-wild.com.